I greet you in Jesus' precious name. Welcome to the chapel. That's where we are speaking to you from today. And I have a very special message for you. He lived amongst us. You know, the power of personal testimony is exceptional. And I want to encourage you, if you love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your personal testimony is more powerful than you've ever thought of. People want to know how has God affected your life. Now, if we go straight to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses. John chapter 1, we'll see that in verse 1, the Apostle John says, In the beginning was the Word. That's the Bible. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is God in print. He was in the beginning with God. Who was? Jesus was. All things were made through him, and without him nothing that was made was made. In other words, he made everything. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now we go down to verse 14 of the first chapter, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version, and this is what it says. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus in print. And if somebody says to you, show me this Jesus you're always talking about, give them a Bible. That, because that's exactly what we're talking about today. The power of personal testimony. If we go to 1 John at the back of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, okay, not the gospel, the book. 1 John chapter 1, I just want to read a couple of verses to you. Listen to this, from verse 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, this is now John the, the disciple speaking. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and we bear witness. We testify. We bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. That, my dear friend, is a testimony. John is saying, we heard him, we recognized his voice, we touched him, we saw him, we lived with him. The Word became flesh. Everything that Isaiah prophesied and all the prophets in the Bible has come to pass. And we have lived with him for three years. And we tell you that he is God. That is the testimony that you and I need to proclaim to a dying world. How many times do people say to you, I'll believe it when I see it? Funny I said that. One of the disciples said that, you know, his name was Thomas. He's known as the Doubting Thomas. I don't believe he was doubting. I believe he was a man that was honest. He was upright. And he just could not con conceive what had happened. Because he had never seen anything like this happen before. Until Jesus stood in his midst. And he said, Thomas, put your finger in the hole where the nail went through my hand. Thomas, put your hand in my side where the spear pierced me. And Thomas fell to the ground. And he cried out, my Lord and my God. And he said, you do well, Thomas, because you have seen me. But blessed are those who come after you who have not seen me, but yet they believe. I want to say to you that he dwelt amongst us. I want to say to you that our God has got no tomb on this earth. I've been to the tomb in Jerusalem, and I want to tell you it's empty. <laughs> There's nothing there because he's not dead. 
He is alive. And that is what people are wanting today, folks. I get many letters from people asking questions. And I want to say to you something now. That what we need to tell them is to redirect every one of those letters to Jesus Christ. Because he's the answer. He's alive, he's well, and he's coming back very soon for you and for me. There is, did you know that there is more evidence available that Jesus Christ walked on this earth than there is that Julius Caesar walked on this earth? More evidence. And yet nobody disputes that Julius Caesar was the emperor of Rome. Why do people dispute the sovereignty of our Lord. It's because the devil himself hates our Lord and he will do everything he can to blacken his name. John said we handled him, we hugged him, we touched him. Can you imagine what that must be like? Touching God. I love that one song. I don't even remember the title of it. It comes up every year around right about Christmas time. Mary, Mary, did you know that the baby that you hold <laughs> and the face that you look into, it makes me cry every time, is the face of God. You see, Jesus is supernatural, and yet he's so personal. He walked the road you walk in, madam, and that's why you must call out to him. He really understands what you're going through. Sir, you are going through hell at the moment. Maybe your business is collapsing around your ears. And you say, can anybody understand what I'm going through? There is one. His name is Jesus. When I lost my little nephew and he fell off the tractor that I was driving, the tractor went over and crushed his little body and he died in my arms. No one can understand what a man goes through in a time like that, except Jesus, because his own body was crushed for you and for me. So I'm saying to you, we need to call on the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things of which you do not know. Because he's been there and he's done it. This God of ours is not some idol, some statue that can't speak or hear. Some person that's never been subjected to the, the things of this world. No, he walked amongst us. He lived amongst us. Everything you've been through, he's been through a hundred times more. And that's why we can identify with him. The power of personal testimony. I want to say to you now, this, this Jesus of Nazareth, you know, the older that I'm getting, the more I fall in love with him every day. He's more than just a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's my everything. He's my life. Do you know that uh, Paul the Apostle had a personal encounter with Jesus of Nazareth on the road to Damascus? The Lord knocked him off his horse in the middle of the day. And all those around him didn't see anything. They just saw him fall off his horse. And he heard a voice coming from heaven. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. He had a personal encounter. He went stone blind, remember? And then he received his sight, and he became probably, in my humble opinion, the greatest apostle in the book. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And yet, he could still say, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Oh, that I might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed unto his death. After having such a personal encounter with Jesus, he wanted more. I want to submit to you today that when you meet Jesus, it becomes contagious. <laughs> the more I know him, the more I love him, and the more I want to be in his presence. Many a time, my wife Jill will come into my prayer room and say, Angus, when are you coming out? <laughs> and I don't want to come out because it's safe in that place. And it's beautiful, but I've got to come out. Funny I say that. Peter, James, and John, Right? The Mount of Transfiguration, right? They saw Jesus there talking with his heavenly father and with Moses and Elijah. What an experience it must have been. I've been on that mountain. I've been up on that mountain. I'm sure some of you have too. And what did Peter say? Lord, let's not go back down there. Let us just build you a little booth here 
for each one of us, and we'll just stay here forever. I can really identify with that. I really mean that. That's why I'm looking forward to home time. Death has lost its sting for me, because for me there is no death. There's just eternal glory and bliss in the presence of my friend Jesus Christ. And of course, you know what Jesus says, first the mountain, then the ministry. Boys, you've got to go back down there because that's where the work is. That's where you need to tell people about the healing and saving power of Jesus Christ. When you get to know the man from Galilee, it becomes so contagious. If we look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, the disciples, after Jesus had still the storm on Lake Galilee, by the way, that little lake, can have some ferocious storms. And he stood up and he just said, be still. And the elements obeyed the Son of God. Of course, he created them. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? The more time you spend with Jesus, the less fearful you'll become. The less confused you'll become the bolder you'll become. You see, you and me, my dear friend, we don't follow a religion. We follow a man. And his name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I am not a religious man. I am a follower of Jesus. Do you know that the early title of the Christian was not Christian? The Romans invented that name. They called the early Followers of Jesus, those of the way, the people of the way. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one goes to the Father but by me. I said, I want to repeat that. That's John 14, 6. Now, maybe in some places I'll be regarded, that'll be regarded as hate speech. I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. And I want everybody to meet the Savior of the world. His name is Jesus. Please say that word. He died for me, and He died for you. The least we can do is to speak up for the man from Galilee, Jesus the Christ. The power of personal testimony. Christianity is not a religion where you are forced, where you are bullied, where you are threatened. Where, they, where you are murdered if you decide to change your faith. No. Christianity is following a man who gave his life for you. You will never suppress Jesus Christ. Never. They have tried to do it for centuries. And you know what happens? Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much grain. John 12, 24, they talk about the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the devil trips himself up every single time. We just think of just a couple of years ago up in, uh, in the Middle East where 21 Coptic Christians were beheaded and it was all televised. Because ISIS decided they were going to put fear into the Christians' hearts. And each one was asked, if you recant, if you deny Christ, you will live. Not one of them did. And not one of them was a pastor or a reverend or a bishop. They were ordinary migrant workers from Egypt. And they bowed down and their heads were cut off. I've seen the footage. And the last one, number 21, he was a man that came from Africa. And he didn't have any faith. And they said, what about you? And he said, I'm with them. They cut his head off as well. I just think of the thief on the cross. And a minute later, he was in paradise with God. I want to tell you that no man would sacrifice his life for a myth, for a legend, for a story. It's because of Jesus the Christ. My prayer, and I'm sure yours too, when my time comes, if it comes where I have to Die for my faith. Lord, give me the strength to do it. And you know He will. He gives us the strength to live, and He gives us the strength to die. So a martyr 
will not die for someone who's not for real. And I'm talking about the power of personal testimony. You see, we are not threatened and bullied into following Jesus. With us, it's a love affair. A love affair, not with a religion, not with a denomination, not with a building, but with a person. And his name is Jesus. And I'm giving you personal testimony. Because he's been with me in my darkest moments. And he's been with me in my highest mountaintop experiences. And I'm telling you, he's the same. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he's the same forever. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. He never changes. You know, he, he's not like uh, a, a normal person that um, when a king or a queen enters, people change. Or when the, 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 the worker in the street, the street sweeper walks in, people change. They just don't even talk to them. He is concerned about every one of you. I'm talking to that widow sitting in that house. She says, Angus, everybody's forgotten about you. Maybe, but Jesus hasn't. That old man sitting in that old age home watching this program. I feel like my family's abandoned me. Jesus hasn't abandoned you. That sportsman who uh, was a household name and overnight he had an injury and nobody even talks about him anymore, but Jesus does. You see, we are serving the Son of God and He loves every one of us and He died for you that you might have everlasting life. Jesus is life itself. That's what John's saying here in the book of 1 John. Jesus is my oxygen. <laughs> Can you understand that, my dear friend? I cannot live without God. I don't care what any scientist said. I listened to a program by Billy Graham, the great evangelist, and he said, I cannot prove to you scientifically that Jesus is the Son of God. I cannot have a test tube and, and, and show you that He's alive, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And I can say the same. I can't explain it to you. It's like when you fall in love with your wife. How do you explain that? How can you explain that relationship? You can't. See? And the same thing applies with Jesus. I want to say to you now that, and I'm not being judgmental, please understand, hear my heart. When I meet somebody, I can see whether that person loves God or not. I really can. Or whether it's just a hoax, or whether he's just putting it on a performance. And I'm talking about preachers as well, just like myself. I can see a man who's met with Jesus Christ. I can see it in his makeup. I can hear it in his voice. I can see it in the love that he, he exudes out of the pores of his skin. Jesus is contagious. You can't meet Jesus and walk away and be the same as you were before. It is impossible. He is our very oxygen. He is the King of glory. Who else would someone be prepared to die for? No one. I would not prepare to be prepared to give my life up for any president in the world, any king in the world, any ideology in the world. But for Jesus, I'm ready. And I mean that with my heart. I just pray again, Lord, give me the strength to do it if the time comes. So we need to understand that. I want to read something to you. I've read it before on this program. Please bear with me, and I hope you enjoy it because I love it. It's that uh, letter that was found in the archives in Rome. And this is how it goes. There was a report written nearly 2,000 years ago by a Roman citizen by the name of Publius Lentulus to his emperor Tiberius. And it reads as follows. There has appeared in Palestine a man who is still living and whose power is extraordinary. He has the title given to him of the great prophet. His disciples call him the son of God. He raises the dead and he heals all sorts of diseases. He is a tall, well-proportioned man, and there is an air of severity in his countenance, which at once attracts the love 
and the reverence of those who see him. His hair is the color of new wine from the roots to the ears and thence to the shoulders it is curled and falls down to the lowest part of them. Upon the forehead it parts after the manner of the Nazarenes. His forehead is flat and fair. His face is without blemish or defect and adorned with a graceful expression. His nose and his mouth are very well proportioned. His beard is thick and the same color of his hair. His eyes are gray and extremely lively. In his reproof, he is terrible. But in his exhortations and instructions, amiable and courteous. There is something wonderfully charming in his face with a mixture of gravity. He is never seen to laugh, but has often been observed to weep. He is very straight in stature. His large hands are spreading. His arms are very beautiful. He talks little, but with great quality. And he is the handsomest man in the whole world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for allowing us to have your son, Jesus Christ, to come down from heaven, leave his throne in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the way in which he has directed our paths. Thank you for the example he has and is to us. Thank you, Lord, for his love and his fellowship and his friendship towards us. We love him dearly. Jesus, you are the only king the only Savior, and the soon-coming judge to this world. We pray for strength to continue the race, to be faithful to you until you come again. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, there we have it. I have read out that description, and I don't know how true it is. I choose to believe it. Maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that Jesus Christ is alive that he loves you, and that he's coming back soon to meet you and me. There are millions of people that have gone home to eternity. They're waiting for you and I. Let us not disappoint them. So until the next time, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. Goodbye. Thank you for watching today's message by Angus Bucket. We trust that you were blessed. For more information about Shalom Ministries or upcoming events, please visit angusbucken.co.za Have you downloaded the free Uncle Angus mobile app yet? You can enjoy more messages like this as well as exclusive content direct to your device. See you next time. Goodbye.